Gracious Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for all the fellowship and the, the opportunity you've given us to study together, to feast upon your word. I pray for all those who are listening, all of those who are, are hurting and, and just hungering to grow in grace and knowledge of you. I just ask that you would uh, allow us to continue to, to fellowship together over the truth of your word. I ask that you would take and remove the blinders, Lord. Comfort us by means of your Holy Spirit and just filter out all of the air, all of the nonsense, but just seal to our hearts only truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. This is, uh, I believe, part four of our study in the uh, first epistle of John. We're just beginning the second chapter. Uh, we're going to be looking at verse one. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And I doubt we get past this first verse in this video. Because there's so much that needs to be said about this first verse. So I hope that you, uh, that if you who have followed us along in these studies, I hope that you are uh, deriving some benefit from these verse by verse studies. I we uh, we all appreciate you uh, for your interest, and I can't think of a topic that is more sensitive, uh, I guess, than than the topic that we're going to discuss, and that is how to not sin. So the whole question is centered around how do we not sin? How do we sin not? Okay? How do we sin not? My, my little children, these things I write unto you that ye sin not. Now, I guess the best place to start with this is, is to look at 2 Timothy 2.11. Uh, I, I don't... I, I had hoped that I that I wouldn't have you jump around so much and and uh, have to turn to to so many different verses, but it's almost impossible to uh, to not do that because of the subject again because of the subject matter. We're talking about not sinning. You know, now it, it may to some Christians, I'll admit, it may seem as if the the, the question is such a simple one. Well, how do we stop sinning? We just stop sinning. I mean, you know, and I suppose that we could go about it in, in that way. We could simply look at it in, in that light. Uh, I, I'm of the personal mind that if our answer to the question of how do we stop sinning is that we we'll, we just stop sinning, then really we're not, uh, we're not teaching ourselves, we're not preaching uh, anything to ourselves but law. I am uh, persuaded, uh, convinced, I've, I have been for over 30 years that that is, that there, that is that's, it's not that simple. And it's, but, but then even in the, in the complexity of something, and, and we tend to overcomplicate things, it's just sort of a natural tendency of human nature, there's always a simplicity in the complexity of something. And I hope that you, you will, that, I hope that that, that, it's my hope and prayer that that simplicity uh, in, of this uh, comes across here. My little children, these things I write unto you that ye sin not. Now, if we turn over to 2 Timothy 2.11, we read, It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, and that's a first class condition, it is if we be dead with him and we are, so you have every right to translate that since. Since we be dead with him, with Christ, we shall also live with him. Our having died with Christ ensures that we will live with him. You know, if he died in our place, we cannot die. We know that. And so right from the beginning here, we're looking at something that which in this case, it's, it's death. 
and life, we're contrast, we're looking at death and life in which there, there is no life apart from death. Now, we, we tend to think that death is something that follows life. And that's, that's true. You know, we're born, we live, we die. And death, you know, tends to come at the end of our life. But when we're talking about things Christian and, and biblical and spiritual, uh, when we're talking about things that, that pertain to our walk and our life and our relationship with Christ, uh, it is important for us to understand. In fact, it is vital that we understand that life springs forth, comes forth out of death. Just like the seed that we plant in the ground, that living seed, that when we put it in the dark, cold, moist ground, uh, since it's such a lonely place, dark place, it's a dark, lonely place for that seed, that, that living seed to reside, but it dies. The living seed dies. And as a result of that seed which dies, it, it bears fruit. It brings forth fruit of its own kind. It's a simple, matter-of-fact, honest-to-goodness principle of human life. It's a principle of, of, of creation. It's a universal principle that, uh, that when we plant something, uh, the seed that we put in the ground dies, and as a result, it brings forth fruit of its own kind. You know, you, we plant uh, potatoes, we get potatoes, we plant tomatoes, we get tomatoes, and so on and so forth. And that's a very interesting place to start, I believe, in this discussion. Because, folks, we have clothed ourselves with Christ. If we go to Romans chapter 13... Beginning at verse 11, we read in that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand, let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light, of light. And we, we talked a little bit about light in our last video. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy, envying. It, it sounds a lot like the, the sin that we're told in, in verse 1 of chapter 2 here, that, that ye sin not, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not, no provision. Don't, don't even make a provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. That's Romans chapter 13. So we put on Christ. Now what does it mean to put on Christ? Just like putting on a garment. There is none righteous, no, not one. Christ, the, the, all righteousness is, if we, can, if we can nail down the fact that, first and foremost, before anything else, that there is no righteousness apart from God, that all righteousness is of the Lord. All our righteousness are His filthy rags. That God has made us righteous, declared us right, righteous, in and through the, the, the person and the, the, the work of Christ, the finished work of Christ. And that's how we stand before God, holy, unblameable, unreprovable in His sight. And if we come to understand that, we might understand what it means to put on the new man and to put on, or to put on Christ. In, in Romans chapter 13, it's, it's clothe yourselves with Christ. That'll, I believe that'll be the heading that you see in your King James Version above those verses. Clothe yourselves with Christ. So we need to clothe ourselves with Christ. Well, how do we do that? Hopefully that'll become clear as we go on. Now, if I could get you to turn again to Galatians chapter 5. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And he goes through and he lists all of these. You, you, many of you know them by memory. But most of you are familiar with them. Of the which I tell you before, as I've told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, and he lists those, this love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. 
And that's a, that's a key. Underline that. Highlight, in that. highlight that in your Bible. Law will not produce these things. Back to, just as a reminder, just as to, to keep it, the verse fresh in your mind as you're thinking as we go forward here. Uh, verse 1 of chapter 2. I write these things in order that ye sin not. In Galatians there in, in chapter 5, And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. They've crucified the flesh. Now, and most Christians today, I believe, if they're any, anywhere near familiar with the whole idea of our crucifying anything, our crucifying the flesh, it, it means that we really live, you know, we can really ramp up that whole idea of living under law. I mean, there's those out there that are living under, the, under law, and then there's those out there who are really living under law. And the ones that are really living under law are crucifying the flesh with the affections and lusts. In other, in other words, they're really working hard. They're striving really hard to overcome the old man, to overcome the flesh, to clean up the, the old rotten, sinful nature, the old man, because they believe that's what God expects us to do. The whole idea of that being uh, s built upon the erroneous idea that, that we are this single-natured individual. Uh, we're just uh, us, you know, we're, uh, we're just, I'm Steve, you're, you're whoever, just write in your name in the blank, and that's who we are. We're just a single-natured individual, and that is not what this book teaches at all. You are, in fact, a dual-natured creature. Okay, you are the creature who is in possession, the new creation who is in, in possession of both an old man and a new man. You possess an old man. You possess a new man. You are neither. You are the one who possesses the old and the new man. You're the new creation in Christ. It's that, that third uh, party, that third entity, the essential us, the essential we, the, the everything that makes up who we are, uh, we are a new creation in possession of both an old man and a new man. And if and if you study this book, you know that the flesh profits nothing. That God is not cleaning up the old man. There's nothing good comes from the flesh. The flesh profits nothing. Uh, all the flesh does is sin. That's all it's capable of doing. That's all your flesh will ever do is sin. You can't change the old man. You can't clean up the old man. You can try, but, but you'll never succeed in doing that. And God wants you to understand that as, as you've been made a new creation in Christ, you've been, you were given a new nature uh, in which, which had to be. It, it had to be this way, folks, because Christ is sinless. He could not be united together with us in our inner man uh, or that there was a sin nature. There had to be a new sinless man, uh, a, a sinless new nature. And we'll look more at that as, this, as we proceed further here. Where that he could join himself to us, where that there could be that union between Christ and the believer, where that he's not touched by sin, because he cannot be touched by sin. He can't... You, Christ is not in our flesh, okay? He's in our spirit. Uh, he's united together with us in our inner man. That is the new man, the sinless new creation. That's where he abides. That's where he dwells. And that's where we are to abide. And we'll see that as we go on further. Looking at Romans chapter 6, uh, beginning at, at verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And most Christians read that, and and they they just simply look at that as as just uh, from the from the mindset, from the perspective of of law. It all gets filtered through this mindset that's legal oriented, law oriented, that we are indeed under law. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? In other words, we can we can continue in sin uh, because that just brings more grace upon us, and of course. 
the author of the Holy Spirit there through Paul in Romans says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Highlighted in your Bible. Okay? How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Uh, it's amazing to me, I find, even to this day, after 34 years of ministry, it's, I find it so amazing how that so many Christians, in fact, I will, I will even go as far as to suggest it's probably the majority that don't realize, and this is, this is so amazing to me, they just don't realize that they are dead to sin. You're dead to sin. Dead to sin. If you, if you wrote, down, wrote that down on something and you stuck it to your refrigerator with a magnet, you'd be doing well. Dead to sin. But we don't want to stop there. We want to, we want to look at what R Romans is also telling us. That we're, not only are we dead to sin, but we're alive unto God in Christ Jesus our Lord. How is that so? Because of what I just got through saying is that the old man can do nothing but sin. The new man can do nothing but righteousness. We have a sinless new man. We're going to look at that in, in this study in 1 John that cannot sin. It doesn't have the ability to sin. The new man cannot sin. All the old man does is sin. Okay? How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Why would you want to live in, an, in a realm, in an area, in a, uh, within a sphere of, of reality that is not true of you at all? Why would you want to live as, as though you're alive to sin when you're dead to sin, is, is, is my point. And yet so many Christians do. Whether they realize it or not, they're dead to sin. They are, in fact, dead to sin. If they, are, if they belong to Christ, they're dead to sin. If Christ died in their place, they're dead to sin. If Christ died in their place, they were crucified with Christ, and therefore they died with Christ, and they died to sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, and, and death itself. Dead. Dead means dead, and we, don't, we tend to, to gloss over the, the word dead there, and we don't want to think too much about it, maybe, maybe because of, of the nature of death and, its, and, and all of its unattractiveness. And believe me, even in the Christian life, whenever we talk about our death to self, which is an ongoing activity in our lives where that God is constantly bringing some circumstance into our lives to, to, to allow self to flare up, to, to expose self for what it is, and where we don't get our way. We want our way, but we don't, we don't get our way. Uh, God has other purposes in mind. And, and just to make a long story short, there short, death to self is painful. It's, it's extremely painful to go through circumstances to, that God designs to enable us to, to come to realize the fact of, that we are dead to sin. Because we were identified with Christ into His death. We're, we were buried with Him by, bad, by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Folks, you're looking at the seed that I talked about that's put into the ground that dies, that bears forth fruit. But it doesn't bear forth fruit unless it first dies. I've often, and I enjoy saying it, I can't say it enough, this is not about us. None of this, folks, is about us. It's all about Christ. Self doesn't factor into our relationship with Christ at all. God accepts nothing from the flesh. The old man, self, uh, it's, it was all dealt with through Calvary's cross. We can know. We can know that our old man was crucified with him in order that, so that the body of sin might be annulled, okay, not destroyed, not eradicated. He didn't eradicate the old man. That henceforth we should not serve sin. But 
the text makes it crystal clear in Romans 6, 7 that for he that is dead is freed from sin. You can highlight that verse. It's, it's a verse that you ought to look at, folks, and meditate, read and meditate on every single day. He that is dead is freed from sin. You have been freed from sin through death. Okay? So when we're looking at in here in verse 1 of chapter 2, that, and we see that John is writing these things in order that we sin not, maybe you can begin to see maybe some clarity. You know, you might begin to see some clarity here. He that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more. Death has no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he lives, he lives unto God. And, and now we come to verse 11, and I've talked a lot about this. This is the first command given us in, in the New Testament, basically. Uh, you might find a command or two in Acts, but, but this is the first command given to us in the epistles. Uh, the very first uh, imperative mood, if you looked at it in the original text in the, in the, in the grammar, it's, it's, a, it's definitely a command, and it's the first one given us, and it's got to be important. Just for that fact alone. And that is that we are to reckon ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And of course, we've got, we, would, we, need, we would greatly benefit by, by spending some time discussing the reality of reckoning, which is reckoning is not faith. Faith is one thing. Reckoning is another. Uh, faith is a gift of God. Okay, now without getting too far ahead of myself, and uh, I'm just, I can't hardly resist the temptation of telling you folks, reminding you of the fact that whatsoever is not of faith is sin. My little children, I write these things that you sin not. And Paul reminds us that whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Okay, is sin. Uh, but we also need to understand that, that, that faith is a gift. It is a gift from God. We learned that from Ephesians. Uh, it is a gift of God. Reckoning, however, is not. And why is that? Because it doesn't require uh, some investment of faith on, on God's part. It doesn't, it doesn't require an exercise of trust or belief in God. Uh, we're looking at reckoning our ourself dead to sin sin which by the way as just so you you don't get lost in in all this now comes about as a result of a lack of faith whatsoever is not of faith is sin are you getting this okay uh i told you there was a simplicity in the complexity here and i and i really it's been my prayer for days that it's that, that you folks will We'll really look at this for just what it's what it is, what it's saying. What John is not saying there in verse one is that I write, I'm writing, I've written these things. I'm I write these things so that ye uh, sin not. That is, I'm, what he means by that is I write these things so that you you really uh, start cleaning up the old man. You know the old sin nature that you died to. That is not what the text is saying at all, okay? It's not so simple as to just be saying, you know, you know, we're not to just look at, at John here as saying, y'all just get busy cleaning up the flesh here. Uh, and, of course, when, when we talk about not sinning, well, now we also have to look at the opposite side of the coin, so to speak, you know, there's the doing good. You know, we'd have, we have to do good in order to not do bad. And so, you know, we need to talk about the good. And of course, the, what is the good? Well, the good is righteousness. It's the righteousness of God that's based on, guess what? Faith. Faith. This is really beautiful, folks, when you try to, when you really connect the dots and look at what the, uh, the God, the Holy Spirit, 
is truly saying to us as it regards our walk, our relationship with Him, in light of the fact that we have an old man that was crucified with Christ in which nothing good comes, and yet we have a new man that's fully righteous as Christ, as righteous as Christ Himself, which cannot sin. And so it becomes, uh, the question becomes, how do we function more out of the new man than the old man? And I think that's what we're going to, uh, at least I hope that's what we're going to be seeing here. In 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, verses 14 through 22, But and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are you, blessed are you, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but set aside the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than than uh, for evil doing for Christ also hath once suffered for, for sins the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh but quickened by the spirit and uh, we're looking at a, uh, a good conscience toward God and that good conscience Peter makes it clear that the good conscience that we have toward God there is not through our own best efforts, but through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay? Uh, baptism. Okay? It's not the baptism of, uh, you know, we're not looking at water baptism. It's identification. It's that identi being identified with Christ in His death. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. It's the only way that we can have a good conscience toward God. Is to realize that just as Christ was put to death in the flesh, but, but quickened by the Spirit, the same is true of us. Uh, to suffer in the flesh is to die. 1 Peter 4.1 For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, same mind, for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Wow. Okay. So we know we've ceased from sin because we suffer in the flesh. Uh, and to suffer in the flesh is 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 to die we we die daily we reckon ourselves daily to be dead indeed unto sin but alive unto god in through jesus christ our lord now we know that, that the law serves a purpose in this but it, it's not to make us righteous it doesn't make us more acceptable to god so we're going to look at a couple more verses here before we go on we're interested, what we're interested in here, folks, is just what John is, the Holy Spirit through John is telling us, that uh, that we sin not. That's that's the question. That's the whole focus of this video. It's, it's a ceasing from sin, okay? But not from the indwelling of it, or the burden of it, or the conflict against it, uh, or, or the punishment of it, or the guilt of it. It's, it's a... It's not by cleaning up the, the old man, but it's through the death of Christ, whereby we also died to it. Galatians chapter 2, For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Now most Christians would say that, that they live unto God by being alive to the law. But the Holy Spirit makes it crystal clear in this passage of the second chapter in Galatians, I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. Highlight that, not I, but Christ liveth in me, in the, in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of, it's a genitive, of, not in, it's a genitive, folks. 
I live by the faith. I think your King James Version has it right. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. I don't know how many times I've heard Christians tell me over the years, Steve, all this grace you're preaching is you just, you know, if, if what you're saying is true, we can just go out and sin all we want. Just live however we want. Has, have you have you folks as a Christian ever stopped long enough to let it truly sink into your thinking, okay, that we're saved by grace? Or is that just some phrase that we throw around and, well, we, we really, that's what we say that, but we, we really don't mean that. But we, we say saved by grace all the time, but when it comes down to it, that's really not the case. It's not how we live. We, you know, we live as, as though we're saved by law. Dearly beloved, I for I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. You can see how that, that shadows or parallels, you know, almost parrots. Okay, Romans 6, 11. Dead to sin, but alive unto God is what we read in, in Romans 6, 11. Dead to sin, but alive. It's, it's like a two-sided coin. Dead to sin, but alive unto God. And here in Galatians 2, okay, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness, which is is going to be on the opposite the other end of the spectrum from our not sinning if if righteousness come by the law then christ is dead in vain and yet we have and this is i, th I think i'm being conservative uh, it's a conservative estimate to say that 95 percent of modern christianity today is living under law Colossians 3, uh, when we went through that marvelous epistle, uh, well, another one of my favorite epistles, we saw that we, we were, and I believe it even has the header, the headline there, put, it, the, put on the new self in Colossians 3, 1 through 3, if, if ye then be risen with Christ, and we are, it's another first class condition, seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Folks, are you starting to see how that the Holy Spirit is forcing our attention? And, and, and he's, and I mean, he has devoted a lot of scripture to this. He's, he's, he's forcing our attention away from sin, self, the law, to Christ. And the, the, the righteousness that we've been made in Christ. It, it doesn't make any sense to live as though we're alive to sin when we've died to it, folks. It just doesn't, okay? If we had not died with Christ, we'd be under law. Or perhaps we would. I, I, the law was never given to the church to begin with. But, you know, it was given to Israel. Israel was given the law not to keep it. Not God wasn't, well, man, I hope they really, hope my, my people, Israel, I hope, I'm just hoping that they'll keep the law. And, and then when they didn't, he's all disappointed, like, gosh, I'm just so disappointed they didn't keep the law. That was not the case at all. Okay, God knew that they couldn't keep the law. He gave them the law, knowing that they, they couldn't keep it. It was to prove that the law couldn't save anyone, that man cannot, through the law, gain merit gain acceptance before god that law the law drives us to christ our life who is the very fulfillment of the law and by the way we have that very fulfillment living inside us today death folks is the great em emancipator okay we are redeemed by his death in our place we are saved that is delivered by means of our death with him and if you don't know that you have died with Christ, if you don't know that you have been freed from sin, 
Just as His death in our place was necessary for justification, our, our death with Christ was necessary when it comes to the manner of our walk. And because He lives, we live. Uh, we are not saved by His death. We're made righteous by His death. But we are saved, that is, delivered by His life. You know, back to nature. The, that living seed, folks, that you plant in the ground dies. And as a result, it bears fruit. It brings forth fruit of its own kind. That is what is taking place in the spiritual realm of everything as it pertains to Christ in the Christian life. You are not on your own. God didn't leave you on your own and then uh, step back and offer assistance to, to you to help you clean up the flesh. That is not the dynamic that is taking place. The dynamic that is really truly taking place is one that is so fabulous, so marvelous, so wonderful that it's, it, it really is it's, it's beyond description. Dearly beloved, we are told in 1 Corinthians 15, 56 that the sting of death is sin. The sting, the prick, the wound, okay, of death is sin. Sin caused death. Go all the way back to Genesis, the Garden of Eden. The, the sting of death is sin. The same is true today. And the strength... Of sin, where, where sin gets its strength, where sin gets its power and opportunity, is the law. Now, folks, I don't know what you you. I, I don't know what Christians today do with that verse when when it, the 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 text is clearly saying that it was a, a res, death was a result of sin, and yet the strength of sin is the law there is no coming back from that death except being made alive in christ a new man wherein uh, god's righteousness dwells my little children these things i write unto you that ye sin not and we're told in romans 14 23 23 whatsoever is not of faith is sin it's amazing how that we see this whole reality take place in genesis in the garden of Eden, in the garden uh, we see it in jesus uh, with his disciples uh, uh, abide in me and i and you i'm the vine you you are the branches you know we don't we can't produce anything uh, on our own we, we can't produce righteousness in and of ourselves it has to come through god it has to come through the inner man it all it is only channeled through the new man and that is that is how we are to to understand our walk and our relationship with christ and whatsoever is not of faith is sin okay we tend to look at sin and, and again it's my little children these things write on to you that ye sin not okay that's what we're reading in this first verse. The Holy Spirit through John is, is clearly saying that ye sin not. But in the question has to become in our minds, how do we sin not? How do we not sin? How do we do that? And if you just say, well, we just don't sin, that's, that's really, that's directing us more toward law. It's directing us away from grace to law. Back to law. Back to the very thing that, that caused the problem in the, in, the, in the first place. The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. Now, it's interesting. Uh, when we look at John, same author, the Gospel of John, chapter 6. When, when, when Jesus' disciples said unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? And notice that it's, they, they use the word pl works, plural, okay? The works, plural, of God. Now, these are His chosen disciples. They are already redeemed. They already belong to Him. He chose them. He, he chose those disciples. They belong to God. God redeemed these disciples. Okay? They belong to Him. This is not some evangelistic verse. Okay? Now that we are, are truly God's people, 
What should, we could ask the same question. What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Because it's a present tense, maybe we, and it's a subjunctive mood. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. And, and that's the works of God, plural. And Jesus answered and said unto him, this is the work singular. Notice how he changes he, the work from plural to singular. He corrects them. This is the singular work of God, he says. This is the work of God, not your work. Their focus was on what we might do to, to do the works of God. And Jesus completely removes it from the reality of works plural to works singular and says this is the singular work of not you, but of God. And that is that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. So there, there's your answer right there. How do we sin not? We believe. Amazing how simple that is, isn't it? Why is that true? Because when we exercise faith in God, when we're trusting in God, when we're believing on Him, and, and the word is not on in the original text, it's ice, it's into, when we believe into Him whom He hath sent, okay, that is the work of God. That is the area in which God is working. It is a righteousness that's based on faith. It is the righteousness of God that's based upon faith. How about Ephesians 2.10? For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. What is the them? Okay? That's the finished work of Christ. It... it, it it aligns itself, folks, Ephesians 2.10 aligns itself perfectly with the whole idea of everything else we've been talking about. That it is not of the flesh, it is of the, of the new man, the sinless new man. It is, it is by faith, it's the righteousness of God that's based upon faith. We're not under law, it's not cleaning up the old man, but it is walking, okay, walking in the finished work of Christ. And, and no wonder it says, unto good works which God hath before ordained. Okay? It, this is our only walk. Our only walk is in Christ, our life, in, in which Christ is literally, quite literally, our life. Because it's for, to me, to live is Christ. Okay? And to die is gain. Dearly beloved, a haughty look, a proud heart, and the plowing of the wicked are sin. Proverbs 21, 4. The plowing of the wicked, okay, is sin. The plowing. Now, you wouldn't think that plowing in and of itself would, that there would be any, it, you, it's, I, I hardly even know how to even expound upon that verse. What it's saying is, is that the wicked, it doesn't matter what they do, they can, they can plow a field, they can build a barn, they can, they can feed the, ho the homeless, the, the poor, the hungry, the clothe, clothe the, the naked. They can, they can do whatever they do, whatever the wicked does is sin. Why is that? Because there is no new nature, okay? We're talking about the wicked, okay? They are, they are indeed a single-natured individual, because they haven't been born again, they haven't been given a new nature in which there's a conflict, as we see in Romans 7, between the, the old man and the new man. So even the plowing of the wicked is sin. And of course, everybody ought to be familiar with John chapter 15. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Okay? And Christians read that and they, and they think, well, okay, God will help me clean up the old man. And folks, that's not what that's talking about at all. He's the vine. We're the branches. We're the, we're the con, we are the conduit, okay, through which the work of God in and through our lives produces the righteousness of God in, in and through our lives, which is when we talk about the righteousness of God, we're, we're basically talking about the fruit Okay, the much fruit for without me, you can do nothing. 
it, the text is clearly saying that, that the flesh produces nothing but sin and death. That there's no, in, in the flesh dwells no good thing. That our relationship, our walk with Him is one of utter dependence upon God. That abiding, that remaining in Him as our source of life, not our, our rotten sinful flesh. So that helps with, in, with the discussion here. Then when we talk about the, the, you know, how the, the new man cannot sin, which is uh, 1 John will clearly see that in this, in this, in this book. Uh, in the old man, all it does is sin, which we've, we've, we also see that in, at that point comes across heavily in the, in our, in the book of Romans, as we saw in Romans, especially Romans chapter 7. All the old man does is sin. What we want to do, we don't do. We do the very thing that we don't want to do. Who shall deliver me from this body of sin and death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Uh, my little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. So just who is the Holy Spirit through John speaking to here? He can't be speaking to the new man, folks, because the new man cannot sin. Okay? He's not telling the new man not to sin. Okay, the new man can't sin. So who's he, who is he talking to when he says that ye sin not? Well, it can't be the new man. Likewise, it can't be the old man. And this is what I've, the point I've been trying to get across in several videos. The old man, that's all the, the old man does is sin. It's not capable of doing anything other than sinning. The flesh profits nothing. Nothing good comes from the flesh. All the old man does is sin. All your old man ever does is sin so john or the holy spirit through john cannot be addressing this to the old man so now if, if he's not addressing it to the new man and he's not addressing it to the old man just who is the holy spirit through john speaking to here and and it, it's not it's not as complicated as it seems folks he's speaking to us it's the text is clearly pointing out that if we are not our old man, we are not our new man, we are a new creation in Christ which is who is in possession of both an old man and a new man. The question becomes which nature, which man, new man, old man, which one are we going to function out of? More out of. Okay? We, we obviously, sh at least we should want to function more out of the new man than the old man. Uh, but we're never going to resolve that conflict in this life. There will always be a conflict between the two. The new man cannot do everything it wants to do because of the old man. And likewise, the old man can't do everything it wants to do because of your new man. If it wasn't for your new man, you'd be doing a lot more of that awful junk than what you are now. But it's important that we understand that we are a dual-natured individual. We're not a single-natured individual in which God has left it up to our own devices, our own schemes, our own strategy, our, our own exercise of will and strength to overcome the power, the strength of the old man. Because it was only through death could, could God resolve that, and He did. That's just the point. We have died to sin. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And we're told that we're dead to sin. Let that sink in, folks. Let it sink in. Now, as we go on through this uh, beginning of chapter 2, as we go on and, and cover the first uh, several verses of this, we're going to be looking at a lot in, in our next video. Uh, there's a lot of exciting stuff to look at here. The dearly beloved is a term of endearment. It's, uh, in fact, it's only used, I believe, eight times. Uh, it's used uh, once of Christ in, in speaking to his disciples, or that he, he told them, and this is in the same book, or the same author, the Gospel of John, where Jesus uh, told his disciples, where I'm going, you can't come. But, you know, I'll send the Comforter, and, and uh, uh, they, 
it's it's a it's a term of endearment it if anything the little children says beloved you could almost almost translate it dearly beloved my little children we, we see that in john chapter 13 where that jesus is jesus uses that phrase one time the rest of the time the other seven times is we're going to see uh, john use it in in this epistle or his epistles uh, we're going to look at the fact that uh, we're just we're just going to be looking at at, at these words sin uh, advocate advocate did you know that you have the best attorney okay you got the best lawyer and I, and I want you to take note of the fact that we we cannot we absolutely it is impossible to see Christ as our advocate our attorney one who stands before God pleading our case before God not on the basis of human merit it's Christ is it standing before the father saying look at what Steve done Steve's been a pretty good boy today and boy look at all he's done that's not the defense okay the defense of our attorney and he's the best there is is he's pleading the case from the standpoint that he himself is our advocate okay he's not just our 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 defense attorney our our lawyer okay but he's pleading the case on behalf of what he did not on behalf of what we did and there is no way folks on this god's green earth that jesus could be our advocate and be our prosecutor at the same time and yet and yet you have countless numbers of christians who believe that god is somehow their prosecutor Folks, we have an advocate. If we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Okay? He's the, the propitiation, the satisfaction for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That gets in, that takes us into the, the idea of universal atonement, where that all transgressions were removed in Christ. That's why babies go to heaven. But it's, it's so Adam's transgression was removed in Christ. We're, all were made alive. But then there comes a time, as we see in Romans 7, where the, the, the law comes in and sin revives and we die. We die in our own sins. Okay? And to not be born again, which in our case we were, but in, in the case of those who were not born again and they die in their own sins, they become twice dead. And we... We, we looked at that once before in Jude chapter 1 verse 12 uh, where Jude talks about those within the congregation that are twice dead doesn't mean well well there's some dead and these these, these guys are dead and and these guys over here they're really dead so that's what twice dead means and that's but that's not what twice dead means twice dead means you died you died once in Adam the transgression was removed in Christ. You were made alive in Christ, but then the law came in, sin revived, and you died. And as a result of not being born again, you're, you remain in a state in which you are twice dead. So that's why he died, not only for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He had to satisfy God's demand for justice in, in, as it concerns sin. And then we'll, we'll go on from verse 3. Uh, and hereby we, we do know that we know Him if we guard His commandments. The word know is, is an experiential knowledge. It's not oida, perfect knowledge. We know that we know Him, have an experiential knowledge of Him, because we guard His commandments. Guard His commandments. His commandments. Not the commandments of Moses. Not doing the commandments of Moses. We are guarding the commandments of Christ. Huge difference, folks, okay? And Christians, by the score, fail to pick up on that. We are guarding His commandments. And he that says, I, I know Him, that's, again, experiential knowledge, and, and guardeth not His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, guards his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Not his love for God, but the love of God. How much do you know 
today, this day, dearly beloved, how much do you know that God loves you? Hereby know that we are in Him. Here's how we know that we're in Him, folks. He that says He abides in Him, and that again, that takes us back to John 15, branches, we the branches, He the vine, we abide in Him, He produces in and through us what we could not possibly produce in and of our own in our own strength uh, it is uh, it's akin to uh, the whole idea of john 15 the vine and the branches is, is akin to to paul saying for to me to live is christ okay our abiding in him it is christ manifest in and through our lives doing through us by faith what the, the flesh would never be able to do and so he that says he abides in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. To walk even as he walked. Now that's a pretty high calling. And it would be impossible. In the, it is impossible in the flesh. The only way that that's possible to walk even as he walked is to realize, folks, that it's not talking about our living our lives for God in the flesh. It's talking about Christ living his life in and through us. Okay. So we're going to be looking at, at more of this as we go on. Look, I, I love you all. I truly do. And I want to thank you all for all of your your prayers, uh, for the direction of this ministry, for prayers for concerning my health. Uh, I pray for you all constantly that, that God would take and remove the blinders, that he would bring more clarity and understanding into your life as, as it concerns your walk in Christ, your growth and grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ uh, in whom we await, we so anxiously await to take us home. I don't know when that's going to be, but I can see that we are inching ever so more closer to that day. I believe that the wheels of prophecy turn slowly, but he will come just as he promised. Thank you for all your kind comments, all your support, everything. And until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.